Welcome everyone. My name is Kathy Molig. She, her, her are my pronouns and I am the Executive Director of Trans Family Support Services. We work with trans youth and their families all over the country and we're really um, very happy to be able to present this uh, workshop for you all. So I'm going to ask my co-presenters to do a quick introduction for each of them and then we'll get rolling. So Al. Hi, my name is Al Johnson. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am the education facilitator with Trans Family Support Services. And hi, my name is Gregory Richardson. I'm the youth programs coordinator for Trans Family and my pronouns are he and they. Awesome, we're gonna, gonna hear a lot more from both of them and in particular talking about those pronouns in case you're confused at all by, um, by any of that. So real quickly, we aren't here to change anybody's values or beliefs. Those are, are for you. Sorry, a fire alert. Those are for you to be able to hold. We're just here to kind of provide an education to bring some awareness around the trans and non-binary identities, um, to be able to give you some, some, some information as far as language, maybe help to demystify some of that language and to ensure that trans people have equal um, access and equal treatment. So we can't have this conversation without having a basis of just what is gender identity. Most of us have never really given much of a thought to it um, because our gender identity aligns with the sex we were assigned at birth. But that's not the case for everyone. So gender identity is defined as the innate sense of knowing who we are. It's based in our brain. Um, and researchers have proven that most of us know our gender somewhere between the ages of three and five, but that doesn't necessarily mean we know what to do with that information at that, that age. Um, gender is not the same as sex assigned at birth, and we're going to talk some more about that. So we live in a society that is very binary in our, our gender, in our gender expression. Uh, there's a pink box and a blue box and, and everyone needs to fit in those. And what we really know is that gender has so much more to it than just these boxes. And society's just starting to take a look at and explore the places of gender being outside of these binary uh, fixtures. So I like to equate it to handedness. So if any of you are left-handed or if you have loved ones that are left-handed, you know, we, we talk in terms of left-handed people didn't decide to become left-handed. Left-handed people are born left-handed. And, and this piece of having this innate sense of knowing that's what you are and who you are, even when society tries to push against that. So if we think back to previous generations with left-handed people, um, children in particular were tried to, we're tried to convert them to not being left-handed, right? We even had schools where teachers would tie kids' hands behind their back to force them to write with their left, with their right hand. Um, and, and people who, you know, demonized left-handed people. And so if we think about gender identity and trans experiences in this way, it's not that there is that many more trans people now than there ever used to be. It's just that there is an acceptance of trans individuals now, just like there was an acceptance of left-handed people. There's vocabulary around it. And so we are seeing what it appears to be more trans youth in particular, but really we're just opened up a space in our society for people to be able to identify that way. So we have a quick video here to share. Thumbs up on the sound. Six years ago, I gave birth to my first and only child. A boy. I'm 29, and I really love you. When he was two years old, my son began insisting on wearing only pink clothes, preferably ones with lots of sparkles and ruffles on them. She dresses so pretty. She really loves me. She really 
When he turned three, he begged me to buy him some dresses and let him grow his hair long. That made the grandparents a little nervous, but we went with it. That one's a fairy and that one's a princess. Why is she a fairy and she's a princess? Because fairies are magic and princesses don't. That's the difference. And also, they can't fly and they, they can. Fairy fly and princesses walk. And then one day, in a conversation that I kind of knew was coming, but it still knocked the wind out of me, my child told me that he was actually a girl, not a boy. He looked me in the eyes and told me something had gone wrong in my tummy that made him come out as a boy instead of a girl. He wanted me to put him back. He begged me to put him back, to fix this mistake. He was three years old. I spent the following year resisting, trying to present alternatives. I told my child over and over again that he could continue to be a boy and play with all the Barbies he wanted and wear whatever he liked, dresses, skirts, all the sparkles money could buy. But my child said no. Absolutely not. She was a girl. What are your favorite things to play with? My princess things. Your princess things? Why do you like princesses so much? I just kind of do. Do you think it's okay for boys to like princesses? Uh, but I'm a girl. After 12 long months of making both myself and my child miserable, I finally let my little boy go. Goodbye. Hello, now let's do it. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. We switched to female pronouns and told our family and friends that she was a girl now. She wanted a new name a girl name. At first, she picked Rainbow. I was relieved when she changed her mind and named herself after her aunt. So now I have a girl. Talk about princesses. A daughter. Actually, I need to hear about how spaceships fly. A really happy daughter. <laughs> I adore my daughter, but sometimes I look at photos of my baby boy and I miss him so much. This probably sounds crazy, but sometimes I wonder where he is. It's like he was a dream I had one night and then morning came and I woke up and he was gone. And now there's this little girl in his place telling me that the boy was just a dream, just someone I imagined. As far as she is concerned, there never was a boy. Could you explain that to me one more time? What's the difference between you and Holly? She has a vagina and a penis. She I'm a girl with a penis and she is a girl with a vagina. You're a girl with a penis and she's a girl with a vagina? Yes. So now that I have a daughter instead of a son, what does this actually mean for her? And for me as her mother? Pink is a mama. Pink is a mama. Not Other than letting her wear pretty dresses and using different pronouns, what has actually changed? What does this newly minted girl need to know? What do I need to teach her about how to be a girl? The girl alien does all the work while the boy alien sleeps and eats. Do I even know how to be a girl? The girls also have blue and purple spots.
And if a girl can be a senator or an astronaut or a plumber, if a girl can wear pants and have short hair, if a girl can even have a penis, what is a girl anyway? Who gets to decide if you're a boy or a girl? Me! everyone again my name is Al my pronouns are they them theirs um, so we show that video for a couple of reasons first of all I want to give credit where credit is due how to be a girl podcast.com um, it is the whole journey of this mother and her daughter as they navigate the world they do the audio podcast and then they also do the illustrations um, someone asked about that so I wanted to make sure you knew where to find that and so we show that video for a couple of reasons. The main reason being it's highlighting a couple of key points that Kathy talked about in our introduction. The first point being, this was a three-year-old little girl. Um, she was not being influenced by social media. She was not being influenced by her peers. This is something she innately knew of herself. And so this really drives home that piece of our gender identity is highly personal. And it is something that we are intimately familiar with in ourselves. Um, and that information being presented to parents or other adults in our lives may come new to them, but we've known this for a while. And then the other piece is that idea of not being able to convince a child that they're not who they say they are, right? We see this mother and, and the relationship between a mother and their child is really special. Um, and this mother trying to say, oh, well, well, you could like all these things and be a boy, but her child knew that she was not a boy, she was a girl. And so after about a year of, of this convincing of this conversation trying to happen, finally, um, the mom realized that her daughter was not going to be convinced otherwise. So those are two really important points to keep in mind when we go further into this conversation. So what is gender identity? When we talk about gender identity, we really break it down into three major components. The first being that piece of identity who we know ourselves to be. It's based in our brains, that piece that Kathy talked about earlier. Then we have a sex assigned at birth. And sex assigned at birth is usually what we conflate to gender, but sex is just that piece of genitals, hormones, what the doctor declares at birth. And then this final piece around gender is our gender expression. And so that's just about everything else. So clothing, uh, hairstyles, even things as um, non-intentional as the way we inflectuate our voice when we talk. All of these different pieces are gendered and they're gendered differently for different societies. Go ahead, Kathy. Thank you. Um, so this can be really overwhelming. There are a lot of letters on this little graphic, but we're gonna break it down. We're gonna make it really simple and I'm gonna make sure that by the end of it, we all have a similar basis of information that we're working with. So our first letter L, lesbian, we are familiar with lesbian. This is a term that describes female identified folks who, ident or who are attracted to other women. Um, gay is just like the inverse of lesbian. This is a male identified person who's attracted to other men. Again, we're very comfortable with this word. We've heard it around before. We start to get a little bit more complex when we talk about B, bisexual. So in the past, bisexual has been defined as a person who experiences physical attraction to two gender identities. But as we expand our idea of what, or excuse me, to men and women, but as we expand our idea of what gender is and how people experience gender differently, we redefine bisexual as people who experience attraction to any two gender identities. So this can be men and women, or it can be men and non-binary people or women and non-binary people. Moving away from sexual orientation and into our gender identity terms, we have our first T, transgender. Transgender is an umbrella term used to describe any person whose gender identity is different than the sex they were assigned at birth. Full stop. That is the only requirement to be able to identify as trans. You don't need to access medical transition. You don't even really have to tell anyone. But if you yourself know yourself to be a different gender than what you were assigned at birth, you can identify with the word transgender. When we talk about transgender and when we talk about this community, we have to talk about some of the language surrounding the history of this community. So our second T is the word transsexual. When we talk about transsexual, it's really complicated. This was a word that was created largely by the cisgender, CIS, or non-trans community in response to trans folks beginning to access medical transition. There became this um, desire to define a real trans person who is accessing medical transition, who was going through those steps to become, there's a lot of air quotes happening today, <laughs> um, the gender that they identified with. 
and and separating those folks from folks who were uh, maybe unable to access medical transition or maybe didn't want to access medical transition. And so in making this distinguish, uh, this distinguishment between transsexual folks who are people who are accessing medical transition and transgender folks who are unable or unwilling to access medical transition, we've divided an already really vulnerable community in and upon itself. So as we've progressed throughout this community, as we've progressed in advocating for the rights of this community, and we see more and more folks who are not necessarily going to go down the route of medical transition, we've kind of done away with this word. There are definitely still individuals who identify with the word transsexual, and it is totally up to them to identify with that. We would never tell somebody they can't use a word that applies to themselves. Um, we just would not use the word transsexual to refer to the greater community. We would say the transgender community. So usually when you see trans abbreviated as trans, it is in reference to transgender. And again, talking about this complex history, we have our first Q, queer. Queer is another of those words that can get really uncomfortable for some folks. Um, I know when I started doing this work and identifying with the word queer, my parents didn't really know if they were allowed to say it back to me. And that's because queer became this word um, really associated with violence in the LGBT community, usually targeted against our most vulnerable populations. Um, so usually trans women who were viewed as very visible. And what's really interesting when we talk about this history of the word queer is that we've seen in recent years, our younger generations, our college age, high schoolers, and even younger, um, folks who are taking this word and turning it into a word of community and solidarity. So queer has become this umbrella term to describe any person within this big, large, lovely uh, community that we call the LGBTQQIAAP plus community. Instead, a lot of folks may identify with the word queer. I personally use the word, word queer to describe my own identity when I don't know it's safe to disclose that I'm transgender. Um, I'm a student, I work in a couple of different areas, and when I'm doing work that's not necessarily with uh, the LGBT community, I don't necessarily want to disclose I'm trans, but I'm still very proud of my identity and I'm proud of this work that I do. And so when folks ask me, why do you work with this organization, I usually will say that I'm queer. Our next cue is questioning and questioning is also really important to talk about because it gets overlooked a lot of the times and a lot of our youth kind of live in this questioning place for a while. Um, so I'm very lucky that I have an identical twin and I promise this is relevant <laughs> because my identical twin is also a part of the LGBT community. And so when she first came out to me, we were in eighth grade, we were about 13 years old and she came out as bi. And then she was pan and then she was bi and then she was pan and then she was gay and then she was bi again and then at 21 years old she decided she was lesbian ish and that was the word that felt good for her so at 21 she was lesbian ish at 13 she was bi and then all those years in between she was questioning and in none of those stages and none of those places of those eight years was my sister less a part of this community than she is today um this questioning phase that we usually call it is so important to this journey of self-discovery. New words and language are being developed around this community every day. And so sometimes you could be eight years into a label and then a new label is suddenly being circulated around and you realize that that label feels better. There's nothing shameful or wrong with coming out multiple times of being in this questioning place, especially for our youth who may have a lot of barriers to self exploration in regards to their identity. And so when folks are coming out to us multiple times, every single time, we have to regard that information and uplift that information as as special as it is, um, because it never gets less important to the person telling you. Moving away from some of these identities back in the, the sexual orientation field, we have our, our I intersex. So intersex is how we describe folks who on that sex aspect have what is medically called atypical, but what more and more activists in the intersex community are calling natural variants on those sex aspects. So these are folks who may not necessarily have the typical pairings of XY or XX sex chromosomes. They may have XXY or XXX. Um, they may have internal genitals that don't match their external genitals. They may have uh, variations in their hormones that are produced. Um, about 1.6% of all births are intersex, which is about the same rate as identical twin births. Hello. So if you've met an identical twin, there's also a very significant chance that you've met an intersex person in your life. Um, and when we talk about the intersex community, we have to talk about like the forefront of the intersex activism 
uh, movement, and that is intersex genital mutilation. So for a really long time, what was happening with intersex births is if baby had external genitalia that didn't necessarily confine to what was classified as a, a vagina or a penis, those doctors would take those children into operation, usually without letting parents know what was going on, and they'd make all those babies female because it was easier to make a vagina than a penis. Great, parents are told you have a daughter, this is your little girl. She socialized as female, raised female, all of her friends are girls. And around that age of puberty, the natal puberty, they're starting to develop their menstrual cycle. Maybe they're getting breast growth development. And instead this little girl has an Adam's apple or facial hair developing because she had internal testes. Our society doesn't have a place for this natural variance. And so she becomes exiled and she has a lot of struggles in her life that wouldn't have necessarily happened if she had been raised knowing her intersex identity. Um, so more and more hospitals are coming forward and saying that intersex genital mutilation is harmful to the child and to the family unit as a whole, which is really exciting to get to see the progress of. So it's just something important to be mindful of um, when you're going about your own practice. Moving along, we have our first A, ally. Not a lot of folks uh, would include ally in this acronym, but we include it for a very particular reason, and that is that I can talk to a room full of other trans folks. And for the most part, we're all already going to have this information. We all already know how to respect other folks' pronouns, how to correctly use non-binary pronouns. We're very familiar with our own community. And so the only way to make the world safer for folks like myself and Gregory and the youth that we work with is to spread that information to our allies. You all hold such a huge stake in our safety and our comfort as we navigate the world. Um, and so it's very important that our allies have this information in order to best serve us and, and to best further our, our cause and our community. So know the significance of you all sitting in on this conversation um, and being a part of this because it is not slight, it is very significant. And then our last couple of letters, I'm gonna just go through real quickly. We have A, asexual. This is a person who does not experience physical attraction to people of any gender identity. And P, pansexual, folks who experience uh, physical attraction to folks of all gender identities. So the most significant thing to get out of all of that piece is gender does not equal sexual orientation. Just because a person may express that they are trans does not necessarily mean that they are not straight. Um, so sexual orientation is who a person goes to bed with, gender identity is who a person goes to bed as. And you don't have to get it. Um, it can be really confusing. A lot of this is new information to those of us who are outside of this community. So you don't have to understand in order to be supportive and affirming. And we're going to help you under, uh, know some of those pieces to support and affirm without necessarily having all the background information. So why does all of this matter? With our youth specifically, 80% report regular bullying at school. 40% um, of our homeless youth identify within the LGBT community and 51% of our trans youth are denied access to restrooms consistent with their gender identity. And what does that look like? Um, this conversation varies for a lot of us depending on different levels of passing as the gender that you identify with. But for those of us in the non-binary community in particular, this can be a conversation of looking at two restroom signs and realizing that you don't see yourself reflected in either. Um, for myself in particular, when I started identifying this way, I became very uncomfortable with using the women's restroom at school because as I presented more masculinely, I didn't look like I fit in in that restroom. And then we know there are higher rates of physical and sexual assault against trans folks in men's restrooms. And so that was a non-starter for me. I was never going to use the men's restroom. So for me, my solution to this dilemma was to stop eating and drinking at school. Um, so that way I wouldn't have to have this conversation of where do I use the restroom? Go ahead, Kathy. Thank you. And restrooms are really significant to this conversation, but there is so much more. Two out of three of our trans youth are referred to by their dead name. Four out of five are referred to with the wrong pronouns. And I realize I glossed over dead name. Dead name is the name that we were given. It's not necessarily the name we identify with now. Um, there's a 17% school dropout rate for LGBTQ youth, largely due to this high level of bullying. And 51% of California students who are transgender have considered suicide. Um, and this is really significant when compared to this 16% for non-trans students. 
here in California. We have some really phenomenal rights for our trans students in this state. Um, very progressive in regards to allowing uh, name change without parental consent in our state recognizes a third gender option on state IDs. Um, and yet we're still seeing that 51%. So we've come to this conclusion that the only way to get that 51% lowered is to increase societal acceptance. We have the laws, we have the legislation, but we need the social support to back it up. Um, the Trevor Project released data this year that said that one affirming adult in an LGBTQ child's life can reduce their suicide attempt rate by 40%, which is nothing to sneeze at. Um, a lot of these pieces of the suicide ideation can be uh, contributed to gender dysphoria. So gender dysphoria is the distress that a trans person experiences based on the way that society views them versus who they know themselves to be. So this can present itself as anxiety or depression. This is what eventually leads to the self-harm and the suicidal ideation. And the only treatment for gender dysphoria is transition, but again, being mindful of transition looking different for everyone um, and not necessarily being in that medical piece. So we have this little visual, I like it a lot. It's these two bunnies. Um, the one says, what the hell is that? And the other with all this like stuff coming out of their head says, oh, it's just my mind. It wasn't intended to show gender dysphoria, but it is one of the most apt descriptions I've seen of it um, in my work in this community. Sometimes gender dysphoria can be really non-invasive. Um, you know, right now we're experiencing the Santa Ana winds, so I can hear the wind kind of rattling stuff outside, but I'm not paying too much attention to it. It's not distracting me. I'm still able to be present um, and also focus on like other things that I need to get done today. But sometimes gender dysphoria can feel like a jet engine sitting right next to you and you can't hear your own thoughts, let alone what somebody else might be saying. So when our gender dysphoria gets heightened like that, it's really hard for it to start to quiet down and it's really hard for us to feel safe in our own skins. Um, the best way to alleviate a person's gender dysphoria is to be able to affirm them and, and to show them that they are safe in their environment. And so um, to give you a couple more tools on, on how to do that piece of, of affirming a person's identity and supporting them, I'm actually gonna pass it along to Gregory. Hi everyone, I'm Gregory. I'm gonna continue the presentation and talk about gender pronouns. Now, the way that I talk about pronouns, um, I basically start off by saying that pronouns are the most efficient and life-saving way that you can be affirming to a trans person or to anybody. And I think of it as when you're telling a story about somebody, you don't address them by their name every single time that you mention them in the story. I don't say, Al told me this, then Al went to the store, then Al did blah, blah, blah. You would say, Al did this, and then they, as they introduce themselves as they, them, they are speaking and they told me this story and you would continue that way. So our pronouns are really the ways that we describe ourselves and the people that we're talking about. And we're very used to hearing she and he in most conversations, like she is doing this or he is doing that but we're starting to see recognition for pronouns such as they, them, theirs being addressed in the public media. And this is not new information. We've been using they, them pronouns since Shakespearean times, but it's really starting to become globally recognized and validated in that way. And now we're starting to see an increase in neo pronouns or new pronouns such as Z, Zer, Zers, as you can see in the chart there. And these are all just descriptive ways to be able to describe ourselves, describe the people we're talking about, and even our pronouns might not reflect the gender that we identify as because there might be some people that use she, her pronouns, but might identify a different part of the gender spectrum, but still use those pronouns. And on our part, it's just about understanding who these people are um, avoiding gendered language when you're describing people or like using gender to separate people. So um, in a school setting, as an example. Gregory, we lost you. place for trans people or non-binary people to exist in. 
But in any case, all of these pronouns are very valid and real, and we should always be open to hearing how other people would tell their story. Now, parents and adults can be the most supportive by actually verbalizing their unconditional love and support. It might seem trivial to actually say that, but you might be the only person in that child's life to be supportive for them and to be a safe space for them if they're getting bullied at school or having issues with their religious groups that, um, as Al mentioned, having one supportive adult can decrease their uh, mental health issues or their suicidal ideation by 40%. And that is such a huge amount that we can't skimp over that. But um, essentially, you know, having that supportive adult can also be the bridge for other adults to learn from them because I've seen that other adults will hear and validate the stories of other adults versus listening to a lot of kids talk about their stories. But, you know, we're trying to bring everybody together on the same page. And, you know, that can be from researching things online and watching videos from trans people sharing their experiences, um, joining a support group for you and the youth, or seeking a well-trained mental health professional. And even coming to meetings like this, where you're listening to me tell my story and listening to us do this presentation, this is community work that is so effective and that you'll carry on with you throughout the rest of your life. And with that, there is a lot of family rejection. And I would say that that's the biggest component of the LGBTQ experience is rejection from our families and from our peers. But for youth who are growing up in our society where they are able to connect with more youth on a personal level, they still have trouble coming out to their parents because of a religious background or you know, just personal history of not being accepted in other areas of their life. And that can lead the youth to engage in behaviors that put their health at risk, that they might fall into depression or anxiety or be involved in addiction and other mental health problems. And in the worst of these situations, they've faced homelessness and thoughts of suicide, attempts of suicide, etc. cetera. Um, for myself, I would say that um, I was accepted by everybody in my life, all of my friends and peers, except for my parents. And that has, that still continues to be the biggest, one of the biggest struggles in my life, even though I no longer live at home with my family because of that rejection. Um, only until I had moved out two years ago did my mom start to accept me. But since coming out, I faced a lot of abuse and issues with my family and a lot of other uh, family issues had come up since coming out, but um, it would have completely changed the way that I view myself and my transition journey overall would have been so much easier and I would have had a different life if I had affirming parents to be able to stand up for me. So um, it's really life and death for a lot of these kids, especially for the younger middle school, high school group where they're not able to, you know, move out immediately, but they might have to hide who they are for six or 10 years before they even feel safe enough to be able to share that with their families. And moving forward, I mentioned that their, identi their gender identity isn't the core of who they are. It's just a fraction of their entire personality and their entire being. So when we talk about this word intersectionality, it's really a word to talk about the entire experience of a person, including their background, um, this includes their culture, their sexuality, their ethnicity and race, their religious background, and even something, even their disability, if they have disabilities, is something to consider. And when we're looking at the LGBTQ community, we have all the different little acronyms, and those are all, you know, people within their own subgroups. So there's lesbians and gays and trans people that might go to pride, but there's very different needs for lesbians versus the trans community. And there might be trans people that uh, participate in one event, but there might be a completely different event for disabled trans people or disabled and black trans people. And all of those different subgroups have very specific needs for their community. And it's important that we recognize that, you know, one person's coming out is also them coming out about the entirety of themselves. And, you know, for myself, I'm a biracial person. My 
mom is white and my dad is black and you know i've faced bullying and discrimination from black communities from communities of color for being a queer person and typically the queer people that i surround myself with are in mostly white communities and it's kind of i don't want to say negative but i'm lucky to say that i haven't been physically abused for being in either of those communities but this is something that's so common that you know i shouldn't have to feel lucky about that but you know just recognizing that somebody's gender background might be one thing but you also have to consider everything else about that person and where they come from and their culture and all these other aspects of themselves that influence who they are Excellent. Thank you so much, Gregory and Al both. Um, we're gonna gonna talk a little bit in general uh, because we have such a diverse group of people gathered here, right? So a lot of times we're doing this training specifically for educators, specifically for mental health providers, but the Live Well community pulls people in from all different places. So we wanna cover as much as we can. And I just wanna call out and let you know that um, Al and Gregory both are answering the questions in the Q&A. So if you have any questions along the way, they're gonna be typing away as I, I kind of continue this. Um, it's unfortunate we can't just open up and do a Q&A, but you know, virtual platforms are a little bit more restrictive in that way. So feel free to drop your questions in there. So it, it, um, Al kind of talked a little bit about legal rights and it's important for us um, that are gathered here. I'm assuming most of the, the folks that are on this today and watching it recorded would consider themselves an ally or at least working their way towards being able to use, um, use that label for themselves. And it's important for us to have kind of an overview of, of things such as the legal rights. So, you know, we are sitting in California where we do, we're very, very fortunate as Al mentioned to have some really great laws in our state. We work with people all over the country and, and it's challenging in a lot of states. So knowing that, you know, our, our students, our youth have the right to use the restroom, the locker room and the sports team that best matches their gender identity. Um, also knowing that on a federal level, there is, um, there's definitely some movement being, being made and hopefully in the coming years, we'll have even more movement. If you um, really wanna do some, some advocacy work, uh, Google the Equality Act, which has been in the House and has not passed the Senate yet. Um, hoping that it, it passes soon because that's gonna make a huge difference across our country in LGBTQ rights. Um, one of the things I think is really important for us as, as adults um, working with trans and non-binary youth is that we understand the piece around that um, if a youth tells us about their identity, we don't have the right to talk to anyone else or to tell anyone else. And that's really important. The first thing, if somebody does share with you about their gender identity, like really honoring that this is really private, intimate, personal information they've just shared um, and honor that, that they trusted you and honor them for being able to share it with you. But it is not up to us to tell a teacher, a principal, a parent, or anyone else. That's, that's really vitally important. It would be important to have a conversation with how can I best support you? What do you need from me? Um, rather than going around the, the youth and, and trying to figure that out without having a conversation with them. Um, we do also allow in California for legal name change, the Gender Recognition Act that was signed into law a number of years ago allows for um, non-binary folks to have a gender marker that represents them as non-binary and really helping us as a society to move out of these binary boxes of the pink and blue that we talked about in the beginning. Um, and then also uh, medical rights, right? So some people do choose to do a medical transition um, and, and some people choose not to, but that there are rights around that. There are rights with insurance coverage. Um, and we've really seen um, a big explosion of uh, medical providers 
getting trained and becoming really experienced and working with with the trans population um, almost a decade ago when insurances started to cover medical transition. Um, it's really changed a lot. There's still a long, long way to go. We have lots of mental health providers and medical providers that are not really skilled and experienced in this care um, that are providing the care. So we have a long way to go, but it's, it's come a long way as well. If you are an educator or a mental health provider, someone who's working with youth and, and you're trying to figure out like, how do I handle, you know, asking the question, it's not appropriate to ask someone if they're transgender, um, but being able to say that, you know, I see on your file, your name is this, is that the name you'd like me to use? And, and this is a question that we can ask every person we're interacting with, um, not just people that we may perceive, right? So my birth name is Kathleen. And like when somebody uses that name for me, literally the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because the only time I've ever been called it was when I was in trouble as a child. And so that would be a, a conversation that would allow me to feel more comfortable in the situation that I'm in and allow me to not have kind of that like sort of overwhelming feeling um, from the get-go. And then also asking on pronouns. And it's important when we're working with youth that we lay out some groundwork for them, right? Not just what pronoun is best for me to use in our interactions, but you know, younger kids helping them, like, you know, some people use he, she, or they, and, and that allows the people you're working with to know that you have a little bit of an understanding and more importantly, you're going to affirm their identity. Um, one thing that was on the slide that um, some of us have a harder time wrapping our head around those neo pronouns, right? If it's outside the they, them, it's like, wait, what, what? Um, and, and so getting yourself to like have that poker face and not go to that like, wait, what are you telling me I'm supposed to use because I don't understand. And just um, leaning into and, and, you know, I use the phrase of tell me more about that um, when it's something that I'm really not understanding very well. Um, and then, you know, where do we go next? So this is this is an, an hour of your time and, and a lot of very in-depth information that still needs to be collected. So we really believe strongly in that, you know, this is scratching the surface. It's time for you as whatever profession you're in, if you are working with youth, if you are working with adults, either way to really get educated. Um, reading articles, watching YouTube videos. If, uh, in particular, if you work with youth, ask them who they're watching on YouTube and go watch them yourself. Our kids learn so much from watching YouTube videos and we as adults in their lives should be looking at that as well and learning from that. You know, And then asking trans folks if they're comfortable sharing information, certainly not like patients or clients, but if you have other people in, in your realm, um, ask them if, if they're willing to share information. Um, in a non-COVID world, take them to coffee, take them to dinner, right? And, and just, just get that more information. There are a couple of stories that have been um, in the news as of the last couple of days. And one is um, Elliot Page, who is the star of Juno and the Umbrella Academy, did I say that right? Yes, okay, um, who, who just publicly came out as, as trans. And, and there's lots of articles and conversations and some people who are getting it right and some people who are not getting it right and still using that dead name as Al talked about. Um, and so those are good like articles to kind of read. There are, um, I saw several commentaries from trans individuals that really laid out why we shouldn't be doing things like that, that I think are important for us cisgender folks to lean into and, and kind of learn from. And then the other story was um, Laverne Cox, who is an actor that um, most of us know from Orange is the New Black, a trans woman of color who was walking in the park the other night with a friend and was um, assaulted. And so, you know, this piece of just 
out there living your life, not doing anything, just just being amongst people uh, puts trans individuals at risk. And I think that's important for us to have an understanding of and to get ourselves a little more educated. Um, also, PFLAG is a great place for allies and advocates of the LGBTQ community. There are support groups all over the country. We have many of them here in San Diego County. Um, really encourage you to, to look at that. If you're a professional in the field, and a mental health provider, an educator, like really seeking out where else can you get this information? You know, now in this virtual world we live in under COVID, there's so much great continuing education material that's out there and available that you might not have the availability to travel out of state for a conference, but we can all sit in front of our computer um, at least for a workshop or two. So I highly recommend that you look at that. Um, and know what your local resources are, right? So Trans Family Support Services is one, the centers, um, PFLAG, GLSEN. There's lots of different organizations within San Diego County that are working specifically with LGBTQ youth. Know who they are. The YMCA has some great programs um, and lean into those. And so just in closing, I, you know, there's a couple of thoughts here. I think it's really important for us as, as allies to um, be able to take a step back and be okay in the uncomfortableness of making a mistake. Um, that's the biggest thing that I see trip people up. Well, I don't wanna say the, say the wrong thing. I don't wanna use the wrong pronoun. Um, I say lean into it, make the mistake, get it over with. And when you do make the mistake, whether it's a name that you use or a pronoun that you use, correct yourself, apologize and move on right? It's up to us to change our habits. Um, not an easy thing to do, but an important thing to do. Be respectful and think before you ask. I, I'll just share real quickly. I have a trans son. Um, he started his transition nine years ago. And when he started his transition um, early on, I had a, a conversation with a person. Um, Sam was standing there gave me the nod, which meant I could tell this person that he was trans. And, and this was not someone close to us. And immediately this person said, so what's in his pants? My child was 12. Like that is so inappropriate. And, and, you know, most people are appalled at it, but it happens on a regular basis. So we want to make sure that before we ask those questions, we really think through, is this an appropriate thing? I will tell you, I was dumbfounded. My son, on the other hand, I don't know, he gets sassy from time to time and said, well, in our family, private parts are private. I was like, damn, okay. So, you know, just, just think through that. Um, own your mistakes. I will tell you that um, I've known Al for over four years now and, and have always known Al as they, them and, and just didn't have issues with that. And then one day Al showed up to, the, to my office wearing bright red lipstick. And it just completely threw me off. And my brain just, I, I wasn't being as conscious as I should have. And I sheed them um, probably more than once. And so it's important that when we do make a mistake that we just acknowledge we've made that mistake and that we move on from that. Realizing our own personal biases, we all have them. Absolutely, we have them. It's not, it's just part of the human existence and getting over this piece of, well, I don't have biases. Yes, we do, we all do. Um, and so, you know, recognizing that you have them lean into the education piece, lean into conversations with people to help you to, to not have that bias be the thing you're taking action from. Um, so I know that, that there's been some questions um, on the, on the Q&A that um, it looks like Alan Gregory have answered. So I'm, I'm happy for that. Here is our contact information. Um, and, and so I'll just, I'll add a little bit since this is what's up, what, you know, there are no fees for our services. We're a nonprofit here in San Diego. We do work with people all over the country. Our tagline is navigation for the journey. So we may start at, at helping um, a youth before they even tell their family, 
all the way through helping people with any kind of transition needs and, and things like that, helping families really navigate through. Um, so I think that I am gonna open it up to Al or Gregory. If either of you have any of the questions that maybe you answered that you'd like to kind of bring forth for everybody um, or add more to, we have a few minutes to be able to do that. Yeah, um, before we really get into it, uh, there is a question currently in the Q&A that Kathy, I feel like maybe you'd be the best to answer of um, where should folks go to find mental health providers who specialize in the LGBTQ community? And specifically the, the attendee is asking here in San Diego, but um, if you have information for elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, the piece around um, specialized right? Because m most mental health providers on their website, on psychology today, they may list LGBTQ, they may list trans youth, um, and it doesn't always mean that they really are specialized. It's just one more thing that they've listed on their website. So I think, you know, vetting them, um, you know, we, we definitely have a list of people that we know within San Diego County that are really specialized in trans care, in particular trans youth care. Um, but, but having that conversation, calling and asking and, and asking, you know, what kind of experience or education do they have? Um, in particular, if you have a, a youth or a trans person, um, you don't want someone that's just going to be affirming and is just going to, you know, yes, I'll use that name and pronoun. You want someone that really understands what this journey looks like to really be able to assist them. So the other piece is you can go to WPATH, which is um, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, WPATH.org. Um, and the folks that are members of WPATH would definitely have much more of a, a, a specialized um, experience. And then another option that I always say for, for folks within our community is, is word of mouth is a fantastic resource. There's a lot of um, Facebook page out there. Uh, I specifically am a part of a Facebook group that's for trans folks who have experience with eating disorders. And so I get a lot of information in regards to um, treatment programs and options that are trans competent through that. So the community is also a fantastic resource um, to tap into. Um, and then somebody in the chat, and I'm not sure if folks can see the chat in addition to the Q&A, but somebody was talking about, you know, how do we practice good allyship in these conversations without um, talking over the voices of folks within the community? Um, and I think it's this really important place of, of acknowledging your own privilege and being able to have these conversations um, without necessarily putting yourself at risk. I talk about this a lot in regards to the age card. Um, my parents' generation is more likely to receive information from my parents rather than from me. And so I expect my, my mom specifically because she's a mom with a big mouth and I love her for it. Um, but I very much anticipate my mom being able to step in where I'm not necessarily able to and, and to educate folks who might um, speak over me or disregard my own experiences for my age. So being able to acknowledge your privilege in that sometimes the information is gonna come from you and actually be heard and create that starting point for the person within the community to actually share their piece. Um, and then Gregory, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to bring up that you saw in the Q&A or in the chat, but I'm done. Yeah, we had one person in the regular chat, not the Q&A, that was asking um, how to be the most effective uh, ally, and specifically a male ally, without alienating other participants. And I just wanted to highlight that it's actually really important that you share with us the privilege that you have as a male ally, or just allies in general have their own privilege, because they are not the ones that are specifically going to be facing the high levels of discrimination and violence that we would be facing as openly out trans or queer people. Um, but not to say that that is necessarily negative, but just stating by stating that you're allowing us to take the forefront of the conversation and not making the space centered around uh, your discovery about the community, but really hearing the stories from people who actually live those experiences. But for every presentation that I give, I always give my thanks and appreciation to those people because 
this is exactly the reason why we have these trainings is so that we can help facilitate your growth as well as our own. So, um, you know, I always mention that it's important for there to be a diverse group of people in as many presentations as we can so that we reach different perspectives. And then um, lastly, really quick, Kathy, somebody asked in the Q&A, uh, what's the best way of getting in contact with PFLAG San Diego? Um, do you have uh, that information? PFLAG.com. There you go. So yeah, you can find there's multiple meetings um, when we're in, in real life person and there's multiple meetings uh, virtually. So, so yeah, great place to find those support groups. We run support groups for parents of trans, parents and caregivers of trans kids, as well as we have a support group for middle schoolers, one for high schoolers, and we just started a group for um, young adults. So up to like age 30. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of resources out there. I encourage everyone to, to really tap into it. Um, all right. Did we, did we get all the questions? The one thing that I think I kind of saw in there um, was, you know, if you, if you, if someone points out to you that you've used the wrong name or the wrong pronoun, which is typically a lot of people are concerned about making that mistake. Um, it's, it's really honoring to thank them, right? It's really honoring to say, thank you. Yes, I meant she. Um, and being able, when, you, when we say we're sorry, the other person has to kind of make it okay. And it's not okay. It's not okay to use the wrong name and pronoun. You know, we're all trying. I work with parents that are like, I've called my kid this for 15 years. Yes, I understand that. Um, but it still hurts them when you use the wrong name or pronoun. So instead of apologizing, really leaning into being the best ally is saying, thank you. Yes, I mean she and moving on so that that person doesn't have to tell you it's okay when it's not really okay. So thank you all for, for hanging with us for an hour. Hopefully this was helpful to you. Please feel free to reach out if, um, if we can help in any way and enjoy the rest of this amazing conference. Have a great day.